Thank you very much. It's also a great privilege for us to be here and speak to you this evening. And I wanted to start with a little demonstration just to show you how many species of life there are on Earth. And I'm going to use this grain of wheat here. Let me just hold it up to show you how small this is. This is one grain of wheat, which I'm going to use to represent one species of life. So this could be us, humans, homo sapiens. So I'll just put that down here. That's the start. This small bag contains around about 5,000 grains of wheat. That is one for every species of mammal. Over 2,000 of these will actually be rodents, and over 1,000 bats. So actually, most of the mammals are either rodents and bats. Now we have the rest of the vertebrates. These are all of the creatures with a backbone, except for the mammals, which we've already got out. That will be birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish. And in fact, round about, or if not more than, half of all the vertebrates are fish. There's just over 60,000 grains of wheat in this bag. Now, you've probably heard of the expression of something being the tip of an iceberg before. Well, the part of an iceberg that's above the surface of the water is about 10% of the whole. And so we can really say that the mammals here are the tip of the iceberg of vertebrates. Even the idea of them being the tip of the iceberg is a point of view of perspective, but from us being mammals ourselves, we could just as easily be on the underside of the iceberg somewhere and put the nutty snailfish on the top, which, by the way, is a real species, not one I just made up. And there are many really crazily named species out there, but I must move on to the fungi. There is approximately a quarter of a million grains of wheat in this sack corresponding to quarter of a million described species of fungi. And I say approximately, not just because I didn't count them all out one by one, but also because rather embarrassingly, in science, quite apart from there being many species that we don't know about, none of which are represented here, we don't even know how many we know about because there's no central database, there's no acknowledged place where every new species must be recorded. They're all just out there in the scientific literature and not collected together, and that's actually a real problem. What is in this bag of fungi? Well, quite apart from the mushroom-producing fungi, which might be the first that you'd think of, also in here are lichens and yeast, without which we wouldn't have bread to eat and we wouldn't have alcohol. So this is an important sack of uh, species of life as well. The next group gets a bit bigger, the plants. 390,000 species of plants here. And I'm going to put them down, uh, not next to the fungi, actually, although we used to think that the plants and fungi went together as a nice little pair. Actually, we now know that they, they, they don't go together so well. In fact, we are more closely related to fungi than the plants are. So I'm going to drag the plants right the way over here to represent that. In fact, plants are more closely related to malaria, the parasites, than they are to fungi. Now things get really crazy because here, just check I've got the right one. Oh dear, dear. Right, here we've got 930,000 grains of wheat corresponding to all of the insects. So many I couldn't even fit them in one sack. So this smaller sack here is quarter of a million butterflies and moths just on their own. There's about 220,000 beetles as well in there, by the way. And, oh, these are the ones that I forgot about that we haven't mentioned yet. This is a complete mix of things, uh, including amoebas, other invertebrates that aren't insects, of which there are many hundreds of thousands. And I've actually also included bacteria in here, although bacteria are a bit strange because although there are a certain number of them that scientists have named, it's not really clear what we mean by the idea of a species when we talk about bacteria. So there we have it all laid out, approximately 2 million grains of wheat corresponding to 2 million species of life on Earth. 
How on earth could we categorise and get to understand such a magnitude of just the bits of life that we've discovered so far, which is, even that is a tiny proportion of the whole. Well, over to Jan to talk a bit about that. Thank you, James. Well, um, we're here in the Linnaean Society, right? And this is where Linnaeus's original collections um, have ended up. Um, and Linnaeus is famous for uh, coming up with a system of classification uh, for all life on Earth. I'm not sure he realised quite the magnitude of the task. Linnaeus is up there. Sorry, Linnaeus. There's, um, there's quite a lot of them still to go. Um, uh, and I'm sure you all know something about the Linnaean system, which uh, describes species and then has, has so, so Homo sapiens, we're a species, we're in a genus, Homo, uh, we're in a family, Hominidae, and we're in the mammals and so on. And this is what you might call a hierarchical system of classification. So you have something nested in something else, nested in something else. Um, we are talking here uh, about the, the tree of life, but Linnaeus never actually thought about this as a tree, although it's not uh, a very large jump to think of a hierarchy in terms of a tree. And in fact, still while Linnaeus was alive, um, the naturalist to Catherine the Great, well, I'll quote him, he said, um, the system of organic bodies, i.e. species, um, is best of all represented by an image of a tree. And he goes on to talk about like a large side branch of insects and, and below the quadrupeds, the tree would put forth birds as an equally large side branch and stuff like this. So, so the idea of representing Linnaeus' system as a, tr as a tree isn't terribly um, difficult to imagine. And in fact, uh, just after Linnaeus died, uh, someone... Uh, an obscure botanist called Augustine Augier, Augier came up um, with this uh, picture of the classification of plants. What's rather nice is it looks like a plant, doesn't it? And it is uh, a system of classification of plants. Um, but there's something perhaps slightly um, that you should, well, you should think about when you look at pictures like this is that they are classifications. They're just a way of putting human labels on things. And Linnaeus did that not just for plants and for animals, but also for rocks, for minerals. And in fact, if you've ever played the game 20 Questions, you say animal, mineral, or vegetable. The reason you say those three things is because those were Linnaeus's original three kingdoms. That's where it comes from. Um, but we no longer really use his system of classifying minerals uh, and for, for a very good reason. And that is because uh, in plants and animals, the underlying process which generates all these species, which creates all these different, this diversity of life, is itself evolution, a process which works in a tree-like manner. And it was only after we came up with uh, reasonable theories of evolution, primarily thanks to, to Darwin over there and to Wallace next to him over there, that we start getting pictures of the evolution of life and of classification of things that look a bit like this. So, so this is a famous picture from um, a biologist called Ernst Haeckel of uh, the classification of all of life. And there's a really um, important philosophical difference, if you like, between the tr what's the tree on the left here and the tree on the right. And the tree on the left is essentially arbitrary. It's just like giving labels to stuff to help humans organize things. But the tree on the right shows something much more fundamental, which is the history, the ancestral history of all these species of life on Earth. And that is actually a very, very important distinction. And when James and I started out on this project, so uh, we, you will find, found some cards, hopefully, on your, on your seat, um, which talk about the OneZoom project. We, about six years ago, um, came up with this idea, or well, James primarily, of trying to represent all uh, living species, all 2.2 million that we, that we have there, of life on Earth, on a single web page, but also show the historical links between them. So we are interested in showing what's called phylogeny, the history of life, the thing on the right-hand side of here, not just a list, a classification of things like the tree on the uh, left-hand side here. That turns out to be really quite difficult, um, especially with 2.2 million things. And what um, I'm going to do now is to, to give you an idea of some of the difficulties there, and then after that, we're going to take you on a tour of the tree of life, because we have actually made this tree of life on a single web page. Um, and show you some of our favorite places on it, and then you can ask questions. Um, one of the difficulties you might not have thought about, um, here are two species. This is a bell flower. This is a fish. Um, does anyone know what they have in common? Any guesses? Um, they actually have exactly the same Latin name. 
which is a bit confusing. <laughs> Um, and that's because the rules uh, that tell you how to name plants are completely independent of the rules that tell you how to name animals. And so it's quite reasonable to give them both the same names because it's two different bodies who regulate it. And so you do have some species which have exactly the same names, which is extremely confusing. And if you were telling a computer, this picture here of this fish is a picture of Centropogon australis, it doesn't know whether to give you a picture of a leaf or a picture of a fish. Um, there are other rather larger problems associated with using names as well, because not only can one name correspond to multiple different species, but one species can have lots of different names as well. Um, these are called synonyms, um, and some of them are uh, there because one was published, say, in Czechoslovakia, and another one was published in England, and no one realized they were the same species. Um, and some of them are there because one's obsolete and has been replaced. And yet others are still there because people misspell these things all the time. And so there's loads of misspellings out there of names. Um, and they sometimes reach a, a republished under the misspelling. Um, and it all gets horribly, horribly confusing. Um, and when you start coming up with big projects that try and list all species, um, one of the first things you hit is this idea of how do you sort out the names? Um, and what you have to do quite often is to use something called a, a taxonomic name resolution service, TNRS, um, to try and cope with all this confusion and to work out whether a name really does refer to a particular species or not. Um, with one Zoom, we very early on decided that we weren't going to do that at all. Uh, we got rid of <laughs> taxonomic name resolution services. Um, and I'll show you how we, how we did it. Um, we rely on a project in the United States of America called the Open Tree of Life. Um, that provides most of the structure of the tree that we're show, going to show you. Um, and uh, they are a project that take published uh, evolutionary trees from around the literature and try to bung them all together into one big tree. Um, and their data looks a bit like this. Uh, rather dull. All you have to note is that each row here is a species or potentially a bigger grouping. These are all the, um, this has got humans and um, chimpanzees and gorillas on. Um, and this is the bit I'm interested in because it has, a, instead of names, it has a list of numbers to different databases. Um, and so what we do is we take the open tree data, we map it onto different databases, which are via their numbers, and then using those databases, we can then map onto other databases which are potentially more interesting than these. For example, the Encyclopedia of Life, which gives you common names of species, which gives you pictures, which gives you sounds, all that sort of thing. The IUCN, which gives you uh, conservation status, whether these things are liable to go extinct or not. And uh, in today's uh, connected world, lots of people go to Wikipedia, we can connect these to a database called Wikidata, which is a central repository of all the Wikipedia entries for different species. And that allows us to map these parts of the tree of life onto, for example, Wikipedia pages, which is extremely useful. I'm going to talk about Wikipedia in a second, um, but first I'm going to uh, go on to another problem that we have, um, which is the sheer size of the thing. So um, you might have seen trees, phylogenetic trees, evolutionary histories that look a bit like this. Um, and this is quite a good way of representing um, stuff, representing the relationships between different species um, when you have maybe 100 or 200 or so different, uh, different species to look at. We have 2.2 million. Um, how would we see that? Well, imagine that we were writing these names out in 11-point uh, um, font, quite small, um, and uh, we were to start uh, drawing the tree uh, here where the arrow is, where we are right now in the Linnaean Society, then the tree we would draw out at 11 size point would look, point would look like this. So imagine crawling on your hands and knees through Hyde Park, <laughs> several miles around, almost into Regent's Park up there near the zoo, reading tiny size fonts, just which lists, lists and lists of species, and then following the trails back to see how they're related to each other. Obviously, this is completely impractical. There's no way that we could actually print out a tree like this. But with the marvels of modern technology, of course, we can uh, make a, a single web page that contains all these species, and that is what one zoom is, and, and it looks a bit like this. Um, so we're using... Uh, what's called a fractal, what mathematicians call a fractal, which is a form that, as you zoom in, um, expands and gives you more and more detail. Um, and that's what allows us to cram 2.2 million species of life onto this uh, particular map. 
Uh, you can see it uh, on the internet right now. It's available. You can just go and visit it, onezoom.org. And what lots of people are interested in, probably rightly so, is where humans are on this map. So I thought I'd show you. Um, we are here. Um, note that humans don't occupy any one specific, any one sort of privileged place on the tree. We're just nested in right with everything else because every leaf on this tree is, can be considered an endpoint of evolution. Humans are not at the top. We're just in one place on this, on this enormous tree. There are another, um, on the one zoom tree, there are another 2.2 million leaves like that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I thought you might like to see a bit of context where we are um, compared to the rest of our close relatives, like the chimpanzees, the gorillas, um, the gibbons, here they are. Okay. Um, and a little bit more context still, these are all the placental mammals, so the mammals that um, give birth to live young that have been nourished through a placenta. Um, and what I want you to take home from by looking at this tree is because it's a true history, or as best as we can, a true history of, of how these species came into being, then all these branches are meaningful. So if we look, for example, at uh, this branch point here, that represents the common ancestor of all the species that are descended from it. So that is actually a certain amount of ago in time. In fact, we've tried to estimate it at 90 million years ago. There was a single species that eventually was to give rise to not only us, but also mice, elephants, uh, lions, all the other placental mammals. In fact, someone's uh, at the American Museum of Natural History has tried to um, draw a picture, a, a reconstruction of what this uh, ancestor looked like. This was your great, 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 great grandmother or father. Um, here's approximately what it looked like, a bit like a tree shrew. This is their reconstruction. There was a, um, a public competition to name it, actually, and it was given the name Schrodinger, which was quite fun. Um, uh, so, so that's the meaning of each branch, each branch point on this tree represents a point at which there was a common ancestral species. And th there are a very large number of branch points, as you can see. But there's also more. Because this is a history, well, let's see, we'll search here for um, something that's our close relative, a mouse, a harvest mouse maybe. In fact, there are loads and loads of harvest mouse mice. We'll pick the volcano harvest mouse, because that was a fun name. Um, and uh, we can highlight it on, on our one zoom tree there, um, and we can see that it's relatively close to us, us primates. It turns out that about 20 years ago, by looking at the DNA of these different placental mammals, there was a complete revolution in understanding how these things came about in understanding their history, and indeed, therefore, how we now classify them. So there were four, now we understand that there are four major groups of placental mammals. There are these ones that I've highlighted in blue, which are um, ma ma mice, rats, rabbits, and their close relatives, us, primates, and some tree shrews and stuff. There's another group which contains, which well, is quite a diverse group, actually. It contains carnivores. It contains whales, antelopes, insectivores, stuff like that. We'll pick, for example, uh, a fox, but let's pick one that's a bit like bats because there's a load of bats in this group as well. <laughs> It isn't actually that closely related to a bat, but um, it does look a bit like it has bat ears, and I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, it looks like this. It's quite cute. <laughs> um, you can see why it's called a bat-eared fox, right? Um, uh, let's go back. Um, <coughs> what else is there? What are the other two major groups of placental mammals? Well, one are the South American mammals, the sloths, anteaters, and armadillos, of which here which are represented here in green. Uh, and the other is an African group uh, which contains the elephants, the elephant shrews, uh, the aardvark, the sirenians, that's the manatees and dugongs, which are no longer in Africa, but they've swum away. Um, and uh, they occupy this particular bit. We'll look for aardvarks. Here we go. Uh, we don't want the aardvark cucumber. We want the aardvark. Um, uh, and this is the third group of, uh, sorry, the fourth group of mammals here in purple. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because this actually represents something that's happened in the history of these species. Um, and in fact, something that's happened in the history of mammals in general. It happened around 90 to 100 million years ago, and it corresponds to the splitting apart of the continents at the time. 
And so at that time, South America was just joined to Africa, which was just joined to the Northern Hemisphere. They started to split apart due to plate tectonics, and one group of animals was abandoned on the island that we now call South America. The other, another group was abandoned on the island that we now call Africa, and that group went on to produce, uh, went on to diversify to produce elephants and, and aardvarks and uh, elephant shrews and uh, dugongs. And the other set were abandoned on, in the Northern Hemisphere um, and gave rise to us. That's where our ancestors trace from. But also um, the carnivores, uh, the whales, uh, the mice and the shrews and the rabbits. And the point here is that every time you look at this tree, you can deduce something about the history of the species. And it tells you something very fundamental about the history of life on Earth. Um, I did promise that we would stop at various points on this tree and, and show you some fun stuff. Uh, one of the animals that James really likes is the aardvark, and I'm going to hand over to him to tell you about aardvarks for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So we've seen where the aardvark fits among the other placental mammals. Here's an image of one. This is uh, an African animal. And uh, you might have noticed that when we put uh, the search of aardvark there into one zoom, the aardvark cucumber came up as well as the aardvark. Well, that's for a reason, because the aardvark cucumber is a plant that, in fact, has a special relationship with the aardvark. The aardvark cucumber is related to the kind of cucumber that we might eat in a salad, but uh, instead of the fruits growing out in the open, like the cucumber we would eat is, um, instead, on the aardvark cucumber, it's that the flowers get pollinated in the open, and then once they're pollinated, they burrow under the ground, and they grow into fruits under the ground, waiting to be dug up and eaten by an aardvark. So in fact, this is the world's only underground cucumber. As far as we're aware, they exist only to be eaten by the aardvark. Uh, the aardvark probably gets benefit from eating these cucumbers through their water content, because in these areas of Africa, there isn't so much water around necessarily, and that's an important resource. So important and valuable, in fact, for the aardvark that this is the only non this is the only vegetable product that it eats at all. Everything else that it eats is termites and ants. And therefore, the only reason it has teeth is so that it can eat aardvark cucumbers, because other ant-eating mammals tend not to have teeth. They can just lick up the ants, and that's perfectly all right. After having eaten the aardvark cucumber, the aardvark then goes to another aardvark burrow or another area, leaves its droppings behind, and so the aardvark cucumber gets spread and is able to propagate itself. And in fact, aardvark cucumbers only grow around aardvark burrows. Aardvarks aren't just useful to aardvark cucumbers, they're also useful to many other African animals, including the bat-eared fox, which Jan showed, which are often are seen using the aardvark's burrow, instead of digging their own burrow, why not use one that's been dug for you, um, for shelter and even for uh, keeping their young. So the aardvark is a really important uh, species for the African ecosystem where it lives just highlighted there precisely where it is on the tree of life. And one of the things you may notice about the aardvark here in our representation is that it's a particularly big leaf on the tree of life. This is because it's what I would call evolutionary distinct. There's nothing else like an aardvark. It's uh, really unusual, and therefore it doesn't have very many close relatives. And in fact, if you look at the branch of the tree of life that leads to an aardvark, it is, it is longer than any other branch leading to one leaf of an animal uh, on the, the mammal part of the tree of life. You'll also notice that the aardvark and many other of the leaves here are green, and some of them are red. The red leaves are species that are known to be globally endangered. That is, they are threatened with extinction, according to the IUCN. And thankfully, the aardvark is not one of those red leaves. If we zoom out a little bit, I want to show you just some other creatures on here which are red leaves and which are very prominent. These are the long-beaked echidnas. And I want to demonstrate to you with them that the tree of life isn't just useful as a method of categorizing all of this life, and it isn't just useful, as Jan has explained, for showing about the evolutionary history of how all this life came into being. It also has conservation applications. 
There's a wonderful project at the Zoological Society of London, which is the organisation that runs London Zoo, among other things, and it's called the Edge of Existence Programme. And in their title, the edge comes from ED, meaning evolutionary distinct, the big leaves here, the particularly unusual things like the aardvark that there's nothing else like. And the GE is global endangerment. And so the EDGE project focuses on the conservation of species which are scientifically shown to be unique and in need of help, perhaps forgotten by more conventional conservation approaches. And these three red leaves at the top there are the long-beaked echidnas, which are remarkable because like the other um, monotremes in their group, they actually reproduce by laying eggs. That's uh, the, the aardvark and the end of this part of the presentation. I would now like to pass over to Jan, who will demonstrate one further utility of the tree of life in calculating what species on there we would consider to be the most popular. Yeah, so um, I've done something that I don't think anyone else has ever done before, um, which is to work out for all the species of life on Earth how popular they all are uh, with us humans, um, which okay, is somewhat arbitrary, but also is potentially useful for um, conservation, for understanding if people are interested in things just because they happen to be popular, or if, we, if we're conserving them, for example, just because they happen to be popular. Um, it's quite a big task, right? It's quite a big task to give a label, a number on 2.2 million species to say how popular, popular they are. Um, but I can do it, and I can do it because of some of the work that's gone on behind OneZoom. <clears throat> so, for example, if you go to the OneZoom website, and you uh, click on any one of these leaves, if you, click on the, if you zoom in and click on uh, one of the pieces of text, you will pop up a box a bit like this. Actually, you'll pop up one in English, but this just goes to show that um, uh, if you are running a, a German web browser, it would pop up in German and, and, and so on. So we have multiple language translations for one zoom. Um, <clears throat> this is the Wikipedia page for the seven-spot ladybird uh, in German. Uh, if you were to uh, visit the Wikipedia page and you were Scottish, you might get the one in Scots. I didn't even realize there was a Scots Wikipedia, uh, which has a scientific classification, which is presumably what you say in Scotland. Um, uh, and uh, what I want to point out here is that uh, there are things about these two web pages, these two almost identical pages for the same species in different languages, that are the same regardless of the language. And that's these two bits here, which are what are called the taxo box, the taxonomic classification. And from that, we can extract information that's true across all Wikipedias. Um, and it's that which allows us to map, uh, and, and this gets extracted into a database called Wikidata, which I mentioned before, and it's that that allows us to map any individual species on our tree to the Wikipedia page in whichever language you happen to choose. Um, and indeed, it's that that allows us to calculate popularity. So this, for example, is the number of visits to the English language Wikipedia over 12 months um, to the page on the Seven Spot Ladybird. Um, so the graph is the number of visits. The value there um, is the page size, the size of the page. And to get an idea of how popular this particular species is, I just combine them together using a mathematical formula that you don't really need to know about. You just multiply them together and take the square root. Um, and that gives you a value for how popular the seven-spot ladybird is. <coughs> In this case, the value for <coughs> during October 2018 happens to be um, 3,000, but it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, <coughs> however, there's a problem with this because... Probably most people don't realize that there are very large numbers of species of ladybird. They probably just think there's one ladybird, right? You talk about ladybirds, you just think of a ladybird. You probably think of the seven-spot one. But in fact, if you go to one zoom, you can see that we have 1,200 species of ladybird. Um, how do we incorporate the fact that when people talk about ladybirds, they probably think of this seven-spot one, but there are a whole load of other ones as well? Well, we can do that by, again, going to, going to one zoom or, or going to the database that drives one zoom and looking at the popularity of uh, not only the seven-spot ladybird, which is in blue here, but the genus of ladybirds, which is called coccinella, which is in green here, which obviously people don't look at very much, and the ladybird family, the coccinellidae, which is actually looked at even more and is of a bigger size than, uh, than the seven-spot ladybird itself. And we can combine those together in some way because they're all relevant to the seven-spot ladybird. So if we want a value for the popularity of a seven-spot ladybird, we do something, I do something called 
calculate something called the phylogenetically informed popularity, the popularity taking account of the structure of the tree. Um, and so not only do we have the popularity of the, lady, of the individual species of seven-spot ladybird, but also its genus, and also the ladybird family, and also beetles, and also all the way up the tree. Um, actually, there's something more we have to do, too, because here's an example for uh, the gray wolf. Uh, and you might take all the dog family, for example, of which the gray wolf, to which the gray wolf belongs, and take the popularity from the dog family and stick some of it into uh, the popularity for the gray wolf. But you also can see here that the gray wolf has lots of subspecies, uh, including the domestic dog, in fact, and the dingo, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and you need, in some sense, well, you can see here the width of the bars, of the red bars, is, is proportional to their popularity on Wikipedia, on the English language Wikipedia, and nearly all the popularity here um, is stuck in Canis lupus familiaris, which is the domestic dog, and to work out how popular the gray wolves are, of which the um, domestic dog is a subspecies, we need to take that stuff and bung it into, from, from, from the subspecies, and bung it into the species itself, and that's essentially how I calculate um, you don't really need to look at this slide very carefully, but you need to say, all you need to take account of is the fact that we take all the ancestors, popularity of all the ancestors, and of all the descendants, and bong them into the popularity of, in this case, the, the gray wolf. Um, so that allows us, for example, well, not only to calculate the top 20 species, which I'm going to show you, but popularity for every single species of life on Earth, even those that don't have Wikipedia pages, because they, nearly, they all have pages above them as well. Um, I thought you might be interested to see what the... 20 most popular species calculated according to me is. Um, uh, these are the uh, numbers 16 to 20 is the red fox at number 20, blue whale, uh, black bear, uh, ling uh, sorry, puma, and coyote. I think these last two show that actually lots of people are visiting these Wikipedia pages from America, and so they're looking at American species. How about the next lot? Uh, cheetahs, lions, tigers, all those ones you might expect, big cats, uh, polar bears, because they're cute, and pandas. Um, anyone any idea about what the tenth most popular species might be? Guesses? Snakes. Snakes. Uh, us. Because we're, right, <laughs> we're, um, <laughs> we're species too. We happen to be the tenth most popular among ourselves, hilariously. Um, uh, cats, next. Despite all the internet videos of cats, they're only at number nine. Um, uh, and then a couple of species of gorillas. I think the, the preponderance of primates and great apes here probably goes to show that lots of people look at Wikipedia pages about, about great apes and about apes. Um, and the orangutans, um, chimpanzees, but then the brown bear, because they're cuddly. <laughs> um, then the bonobo, and finally, what do you think the most popular one is according to this calculation? Come then. You can, yeah? Sure. Oh, very good. And this is where they are on the tree of life, on our tree. There you go. So I thought that's just a nice, interesting thing that you can do once you get this sort of data. You can calculate all sorts of exciting things like that. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to James to talk to you about uh, something rather different, I would say. Yeah, thanks very much, Jan. I, I, I like that, that we've heard that the dog is, is our best friend, and actually we now have learned that we like them more than we do ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now Jan has shown us all of the popular things on the Tree of Life. I'm going to show you something quite different. In fact, I'm going to talk about disease, uh, but not a disease that affects us humans. This is a disease that was of particular interest to Linnaeus here because this disease creates beautiful and valuable jewels, pearls. You may think that pearls only come from particular oysters, but actually every mollusk that produces a shell can produce some kind of pearl. What happens is it gets an irritant inside itself, like a grain of sand, for example, or a parasitic worm, and there's some debate about which of those would be more likely to produce nice pearls. But anyway, once you've got something irritating inside you as an organism, what can you do? You can either try and get rid of it, or you can encapsulate it in something to try and neutralize the effects that it's having on you. And if you're a shelled mollusk, you already have an ability to coat the inside of your shell with a very strong, hard coating to protect yourselves from predators. And therefore, you've already got a perfect mechanism to neutralize anything irritating that's inside of you. If you are the kind of mollusk 
that has a shiny iridescence coating on the inside of your shell, like an oyster, for instance, then your pearls that you create through just trying to stop something irritating have that same iridescent coating around them. Something that's iridescent, incidentally, means that depending on the angle that you look at it, it appears to be a different color. And that's why we see these amazing uh, colors in pearls that can't really be reproduced, actually, on a computer screen. Why are pearls and the mother of pearl coating on the inside of oysters and other relatives of theirs uh, iridescent? Well, to see, we have to put some mother of pearl under an electron microscope, and we see what it's like at a really, really small scale. And it's a bit like bricks and mortar. The bricks here, those little plates, are made out of calcium carbonate, which is the same material that we actually use for writing on a chalkboard, so not necessarily very strong on its own. But these calcium carbonate crystals are glued together with a protein called conchiolin, and that together makes something that's really, really strong and resistant against the jaws of potential predators. When light hits the pearl, the light waves bounce back and interfere with each other because of this intricate patterning of the different uh, calcium carbonate crystals, and therefore, depending on the angle you look, you get slightly different colors reflecting back. Do the oysters themselves care about that? Not at all. They have eyes very different to ours, and in fact, most of them don't have eyes whatsoever. So for them, this is just about protecting themselves from predators, and they've evolved the mother of pearl coating, or nacre as it's called, for that reason. And it's just a nice coincidence for us that they look particularly pretty. Why was Linnaeus interested in them? Well. Anything that's both rare, as indeed pearls are, and beautiful, as pearls are, is going to be very valuable. And so entrepreneurial Linnaeus thought, if I can make pearls, then I will also make lots of money. But it's not just purely mercenary, because actually there are true conservation concerns around the harvesting of pearls. In Linnaeus' day, you'd have to fish out of the, the ocean thousands or even millions of individual animals and kill them looking for oysters and just keep finding none, which is very wasteful because it's very rare to see these pearls occurring naturally. So Linnaeus decided to try and culture spherical pearls, the first person to do so. What he did was he took freshwater mussels called painter's mussels because painters used to use them for mixing paint uh, back in those days. He drilled a tiny hole in the shell and inserted a little granule of limestone and then put them back in the, uh, the river for six years, which is about as long as it took us to make one zoom. Found them again, opened them up, and found that he had created the world's first cultured spherical pearls. And these are actually part of the collections here. They're beneath our feet in the vaults at the Linnaean Society. And I think they're really beautiful and successful. Others of them are a bit less so. These, in my view, look a bit more like teeth that have been pulled out. And others of them look much more like what you'd expect of a disease that's been cut out of a dead mollusk. Unfortunately, it wasn't an entrepreneurial success for Linnaeus, but the legacy of this lives on because today, pearls are almost entirely cultured. And that's very important because Keeping, taking care of the natural resources uh, that are out there is, is essential. And in fact, even with cultured pearls, natural populations of oysters can be under threat. So to be truly sustainable in production of pearls, you would need to hatch from larvae the oysters entirely in captivity and grow them up for culturing pearls. There are uh, many oysters that do produce different varieties of pearl, uh, but I'm going to show you one particular one on the tree of life, starting from the dog, which is where we last left off our little tour here. You'll see just how many mollusks there are that we're quickly zooming past on our way there. And this is the silver-lipped pearl oyster, also called the golden-lipped pearl oyster. And you'll notice that there's a little bit of writing around the outside acknowledging Cyril Brozard, who very kindly sponsored this leaf of the tree of life. And that is the method that the OneZoom charity, because this is a registered charity in the UK, used for raising money in order to support the ongoing development of our tree of life as a community resource. But 
quite apart from raising funds, what we've noticed is that people tend to sponsor leaves that are special to them. And I really like that Cyril Brozard is one of the world's experts in cultured pearls. In fact, he told me that he spent 12,000 hours diving with oysters, learning about culturing pearls. And he helped me uh, with some of the material for this section of the talk. Zooming out again to the next destination, Jan is going to speak to us about some elegant and ferocious predators able to take down prey much larger than themselves and with very special teeth. <laughs> Jan. Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, it sounds like I'm going to talk about um, lions or tigers or something like that, doesn't it? Um, I'm not at all. In fact, I'm going to talk about something that is probably about as far from a lion as it is possible to go while still being an animal. Uh, I'm going to talk about these creatures on the bottom right here called comb jellies. Um, now, I say they're about as far as it's possible to, to, uh, to be while still being an animal. You can see where animals are on this tree of life. They're the whole of this uh, branch that's shown, shown on the screen. And indeed, one of the reasons for mentioning these is they're currently very much in vogue in professional uh, circles uh, of people who talk about the tree of life because uh, it has been claimed by study of their DNA that they, are at, that they actually don't belong there on the tree of life, but they actually belong, even, uh, belong right up near the, where it says animals as the most distant branch to all the other animals. They're the most divergent of all the animals. Um, there was a paper published this week in Current Biology that claims that uh, actually that's a bit of a mistake and they do belong where we put them here on one zoom, which is a bit of a relief to me and many other people who uh, have quite rightly pointed out that they have nervous systems and muscles and even primitive eyes, which sponges don't. Um, and so it seems quite likely to me that sponges still are the most distant animals, as you see here on the top of the, top of the tree in comb jellies, which are not, by the way, jellyfish, but are their own thing, um, belong there on the tree. Why are they so interesting? Well, um, let me show you a, uh, what they look like. Uh, for a start, they're amazingly iridescent. James was talking about iridescence in pearls. These uh, creatures are iridescent because they have these rows of combs uh, that they use to move around the place. You can see them on the back of this creature here. Um, they're, they just look like glowing disco balls, right? They're really, really quite amazing. Um, and they're iridescent because the combs, are, because the hairs on their combs are so fine that they diffract the light. They are also, as James pointed out, voracious predators. This doesn't really look like a voracious predator, does it, until you realize it's like a big plastic bag with a mouth. And the mouth is the white thing at this end. Um, and uh, although they don't have hard parts, they nevertheless manage to glue some of their hairs together into little pointy spikes in their mouths, which make teeth. Um, and they can also engulf, do the rather amazing feat of engulfing animals that are larger than, them, than themselves, which I'll show you in a little video here. Here's one of them. Um, you'll see another one soon. Um, they eat each other, um, other species of comb jelly. Here's one. Doing quite well there, isn't it? <laughs> um, and they can they can seal their lips together by these little intracellular um, links between the very cells themselves. So although they don't have muscles in their lips, uh, they can nevertheless seal them, making sure that nothing escapes and take chunks out of them using these sort of teeth that they've constructed. Um, here's another one. There's another ten or four on the right of the diver here. It's called Venus's girdle. Um, it looks pretty large. I'm not, I think that some of that's perspective, but they do get to bigger than two meters. This thing is like one enormous flying wing. The way it moves is it moves sideways through the water like this, collecting food along the leading edge. It feeds that food into its central uh, sort of digestive tract, which is the white thing along the middle of the organism, and then it comes out through multiple anuses in the back edge, um, and, uh, and it flies along using its... Um, uh, using its uh, beating hairs that these comb jellies are famous for. But then when it's frightened, it can swim sideways like a worm and curl up like this, um, uh, which is, again, a rather extraordinary feat. I really, I rather wish I'd seen, I'd seen one of these in its natural habitat. I, I haven't and probably need to do a bit more scuba diving. Um, here, here are some more of them. If you zoom in on one zoom, you can see a selection of different species. You can see Venus's girdle on the right there. 
You can see barrow, that was the species that was eating other things on the bottom row. Um, and you can see two other rather amazing things on the bottom left and bottom right, um, which are worms. So these are uh, tenophores, comb jellies, which have independently invented being a worm. Normally, comb jellies float around in the middle of the ocean. These things stick onto um, starfish or onto seaweed, um, and they have these long tentacles that drift out the back uh, that are sticky, that catch prey. Um, and they've independently involved this different way of being, which, like other worms, like us, we're derived worms, and other parts of the animal, uh, animal kingdom, is actually quite a successful way of life. There are only 150 species of these things. I think they're rather remarkable animals, and very few people actually know about them. They're also extremely beautiful and um, extremely voracious, and I think um, all of those... Uh, as well as conservation concerns, because some of these get accidentally transported around in ship ballast tanks released into places like the Black Sea, where they then completely um, uh, savage the uh, local populations of small fish. Um, as for all those reasons, I think this is a, a relatively unexplored part of the tree of life that most people don't know about, which is really worth talking about. And that's why I wanted to mention it here. Um, James is going to talk to you about one of his other favourite places, which again is, is, I think, rather different, and it's a place that Darwin, I think, would have been proud of. Yeah, thank you very much. This is the last stop of our little tour around the Tree of Life, and the setting for it is the rainforest of Borneo, where a little carpenter ant, just imagine, this is probably going on right now as I speak, actually, a little carpenter ant uh, is emerging from her nest to go hunting. And she walks along a narrow path to a special pool where she normally hunts. And she waits around the side of the pool for something special to happen. Eventually, a big juicy cockroach or another insect or something that the our carpenter ant might like to eat falls into the pool, and this is her moment. So together with her fellow worker ants, she jumps into the pool and swims, which is very unusual for an ant. She swims firstly with three of her legs and then with the other three. And over a period of time of up to 12 hours as a team, they get this poor cockroach or other prey to the side of the pool and drag it out and share it among the other ants in the colony. If there are no cockroaches to be had, then the less preferred prey would be something like a mosquito larvae living in the pool. And the method they use for hunting these is in pairs, where two of them would jump into the pool and they would herd them like a pair of sheepdogs herding a load of sheep to the side of the pool. And then one of them would get out and try and pull out or fish for these mosquito larvae to eat, which from observation is not a very successful, but it must occasionally work, otherwise they wouldn't bother doing it at all. What is special about this? Well, it's not actually the ants that I really wanted to tell you about, but it is the pool itself, because the ants' nests, the little pathway, the pool, and the special shading around the pool is all part of a plant called the fanged picture plant, uh, which in Latin is Nepenthes bicalcarata. You'll see it's a red leaf, so unfortunately it's vulnerable to extinction due to habitat loss and habitat fragmentation in Borneo. You can see a picture of it there. You can see why it's called the fangs picture plant because it has these two sort of fangs hanging down at the top of its trap there, which are loaded with nectar to attract the prey of the plant. For this is a carnivorous plant. Uh, it is not after the ants, though. It's after other prey, like the cockroaches falling into the pool. So let me tell you a little bit about why it might make sense to be carnivorous as a plant. What do plants need? Well, they need sunshine, they need water, and they need nutrients. If you're in an area like a tropical forest where the sun is beating down or beating down enough and you've got absolutely masses of water everywhere, then what might you be lacking in? You're lacking in nutrients. And therefore, it's possible to do quite extravagant things that are very wasteful of energy because you've got photosynthesis from the sun, and very wasteful of water, because water's all around you, but you're trying to get that resource that's in short supply around you. Those are the nutrients that your prey, like the cockroach, um, have in them for you to absorb. And therefore, it's worth creating traps to trap insects and other animals to eat if you are a carnivorous plant. 
This particular carnivorous plant has lowered the acidity in its pitcher, in its tall trap, uh, which it would normally use for digesting the prey that fall in there. But it's done this so as to be less harmful to the ants as they swim through the pool, herding the mosquito larvae. It's also done something else for the mosquito larvae. It's swollen up the stalk leading to the trap so that the ants can make a convenient home close to the picture trap or pool itself. Why is the plant bothered to do these things unless it's getting something back from the ants in exchange? Well, the ants are the pool attendants. They smooth out the slippery, waxy coatings around the end of the pool, which are important so that prey slip unwearingly into the pool in the first place. So they tend the trap. And also, by taking away prey that might otherwise escape, or by removing the mosquito larvae, which would otherwise hatch out and fly away, taking the nutrients with them, these ants are helping the plant. And the plant gets all the nutrients in the end anyway, because the ants' waste get dumped in the trap. And so the plant gets what it needs in the end. It is one example of, in fact, many hundreds of picture plants growing around Borneo and the whole of that surrounding region, actually, as far out as Madagascar. And uh, they, they all, all have different ways of life involving a way of getting around lack of nutrients with some kind of private pool. Um, so this one has a relationship with the ants. There's another one which has a relationship with tree shrews and rats and other mammals, attracting them to feed from the sweet nectar on the lid of the trap. And then uh, if this rat, for example, was to go to the toilet, its droppings would be catch caught in the picture of the plant, and the plant would get those nutrients in the droppings for itself, like a kind of fertilizer. Whereas if otherwise this rat was to go to the toilet just wherever it fancied, then the plant would have to fight for those nutrients with all the other plants around there. There's yet another one where it, it has evolved its traps into being homes for bats, so that the bats will go and sleep the night in the traps. And they've got a, a special shape that the bats can see them in the dark with their sonar that they use for viewing things at night time. How did this evolve? Well, if we just zoom out a little bit, and I'll show you another one of these picture plants. Uh, this is one that has a slightly sticky side to its picture. So it traps insects not just by falling into the pool, but also by just getting adhered to this sticky, mucousy coating on the edge. It's a bit more like a sort of uh, a sticky funnel with a little bit of water at the end. And this, together with DNA evidence, is the final clue for something which Darwin thought was not true. And that is that these Nepenthes picture plants are closely related to one of Darwin's favorite plants, the Drosseras, or sundews. These are uh, carnivorous plants also, which you can, in fact, see some of in this country. And they attract and digest insects just by having sticky leaves. And there I end our tour of interesting places around the Tree of Life. And I'd like to finish by thanking a number of organizations and people, particularly the Linnaean Society for hosting us this evening, but also for being the first formal collaborator of the OneZoom charity. And we're really hoping to move forward to doing many more things together with the Linnaean Society in future. Also, uh, Richard Dawkins and Jonathan Drury have been very generous with sponsoring leaves on the tree. They're our two biggest donors, and they've also been great for uh, providing advice and <coughs> publicity of our project. Uh, I also need to thank Kai Zong, who has done a lot of the programming, along with Jan and myself. Uh, Ellen Morland and Luke Harmon are also involved with running the charity. Uh, Cyril, I've mentioned the Pearl Expert. Imperial College uh, employ me in my day job, which is not one Zoom, and NERC funds me in that, which is scientific research. And then finally, the many other donors, photographers, and scientists that have contributed some way or another to producing this one Zoom project that we've shown you this evening. And finally, and of course, most of all, thank you very much for coming along this evening to listen to us. And do please visit the website, onezoom.org, to explore this and uh, learn more about it. We've distributed some little cards around the the 
seats so that you can have those to remember the web address, but if you've not got one and would like one, they are there. And thank you very much for your attention.